West Asia and the Horn of Africa, two regions which over the past few years have seen intensifying conflicts, two regions in which the United States of America continues to play a crucial role, and two regions which have seen major developments in the past week. We'll be discussing both on this episode of Mapping Fault Lines. We're joined by Prabir Purkayastha. Prabir, we'll start with uh, West Asia, specifically Israel, where uh, after years of political chaos, the fifth election taking place in close to four years, Benjamin Netanyahu is back. And this time it looks like he is back with a majority which might be quite low by our standards of other countries, but which by Israeli standards is a good enough majority to be in power for quite some time. Now, of course, uh, he's also come at the head of a government which is likely to be even more right-wing than his previous governments. So, first of all, could you take us through what these elections right now tell us about the situation and the political uh, you know, context of Israel right now? Well, there are two significant things that have happened in this election. I'm leaving out Netanyahu coming back after all the charges of corruption, etc., that he has had. I think the two important parts is whatever little left forces existed in Israel and also the uh, Arab voice, both seems to have been uh, almost marginalized completely as a result of these elections. So they're not going to be there in the parliament because they haven't crossed the 3.5% yeah. threshold that is there, and therefore they don't have it. They're not going to have be there represented. In fact, that's also why this swing to the right becomes even more important. The second part of it, which you, I think, are also uh, referring to, is that there is a openly right-wing party which has advocated that the Palestinian population should have no rights, that they should have no political rights. If they disagree, then they should be forced, forcibly deported. In fact, the argument was that it should be a completely Jewish state and the Palestinian population should actually be forced to leave Israel. This was what Meir Kahane, Meir Kahane the original founder of this ideology represented, forcible over out, throwing out of the Palestinian population and make the Jewish only land. This is the strand, the strand that has come into the parliament this time. And this is what uh, Netanyahu has allied with right. openly. Now, why should it surprise people in the world? Because we all regard Netanyahu as a right wing in any case. We also regard the, the bulk of the political parties now in Israel essentially arguing for very little rights for the Palestinian people and slowly disenfranchising them in various ways. The, here the difference is that it is officially doing so. It is doing so with the sanction apparently of religion because they are arguing this is what is there in our religion and the texts call for this. It's really the Old Testament, mm -hmm. eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth and also who should be considered human beings and who are not really fit to be called human beings. All this, unfortunately, what is there in the religious texts of that time. Don't forget, it's more than 2,000 years old. So those are the things which are being espoused today. And of course, there is a serious problem with that. So when you look at the right wing, which is Netanyahu, then it is quote unquote a secular right wing, if you will. The ethnicity is the identity issue. Of course, it's a Jewish identity, Jewish uh, majoritarian outlook, all of that is there, but it is not referring to all its practices from, say, the Old Testament. And that's what makes it different from the, what is identified in Israel as a religious right, yeah. which is what this is. Don't forget, we had Baruch Goldstein, a follower of Meir Kahane, who openly, uh, you know, uh, killed a number of uh, uh, Palestinian people and essentially justified, it, yeah. justified not only justified it, uh, that was the strand that this is what we have to do, kill these people, exterminate them. That was the was message that came through. And also the fact that the person who's leading this party, Tabar ben uh, he has also been a great fan of Goldstein right. and of course uh, Meir Kahane. So this is the strand which has come openly to power and they hold the whip hand because without that Netanyahu's government falls. Right. And having so many elections take place, therefore the stability coming from this is itself the one which will destabilize Israel. 
and we are likely to see therefore the growth of this conflict even beyond what it is today. That means an open espousal of export the Palestinians to other countries. Now who's going to take them is a different issue. But slowly disenfranchise them, take away their citizenship, take away various rights. All of these, I think, are on the cards now. These things have been happening all this while. While they have been saying these are not true, etc., etc., these things have been happening. But this is now going to happen officially. And I think that is the nature of the state then that is going to come into question. Right. And it's reported that Ben Guir might actually get the internal security ministry and control the police. So all the more likelihood. And that's we, a very important point because right. that's how actually they infiltrated the army. Mm -hmm. And now if they infiltrate the police, then we can see the consequences of this. Absolutely. Prabhu, in this case, in this context, of course, a uh, big question for the Palestinians because uh, they have, I think, also uh, over the years, uh, there has been an increase in uh, Palestinian resistance as well in various, in various methods, in various forms. And Israel has responded by, uh, in, in the most brutal way, 2022, I think, being having seen the largest number of deaths since 2005 or 6, even when a so-called liberal government was in power. So do you also foresee the resistance sort of intensifying not only in the occupied territories, but also what is in t t called 1948 Israel over there? I think both places the resistance is going to be stronger, partly because the 48 Palestinians, 48 Israelis, whichever, whatever term you want to use, are the ones who were not openly under attack for a long time, right. but increasingly, last 10, 15 years, the fact that they're isolated, they don't have access to various facilities, they're essentially second-class citizens. All of, the, all of that has intensified, and they have, been, they have started to participate in some of the movement that had taken place across Palestine, as well as what would be called Israel in that sense. So occupied Palestine or in Israel, there has been movements, and there has been solidarity which has been building. Up. Right. So which way does it go? This is a big question. It will depend actually on what happens in Israel also. It's not going to be Palestinians deciding alone because it's also going to, some decisions are also going to be made for them by what Israel is going to do and particularly this right-wing government. Right. So I think it's very much open to which way it is going to go. And it's the part of a much larger picture in West Asia. There is also Iran, there is also Syria, there is also Lebanon. So how all of these are going to shape up is, is also going to address for Israel the question, are they a part of West Asia or are they just simply a Western extension into West Asia? I think that's the existential, larger existential question for Israel. They still, with all that we are seeing now, feel that they are an external uh, intrusion into West Asia on behalf of the West. Right. Prabhupada, moving on to the other topic which is also very uh, significant, which is that a peace deal has finally been signed in Ethiopia. Uh, this happened on the 2nd of November, ending close to two years of war between the Ethiopian government and the Tigray uh, People's Liberation Front, a very brutal war, huge humanitarian crisis going on there. A lot of allegations of Western involvement in uh, and, and their support for the TPLF as well. But finally, a peace agreement signed in South Africa. Uh, apparently, the TPLF is said to be disarmed. They will be reintegrated into the Ethiopian political system. So could you tell us, take us through why this agreement is significant? And, you know, uh, of course, what, what will happen is a big question. We're not going there. But right now, why is this uh, uh, agreement quite significant? It's been a brutal war for the last two years. But if you look at the larger history, Tigray Liberation Front or what it represents, ran Ethiopia yeah. for quite some time, and it was backed by the West. If you remember also, the relationship between Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Somalis has this triangular relationship, also has, has it had its problems, in which the United States has once supported Somalia, once supported Ethiopia, and Tigray was their favored uh, support base in the region. They destroyed Somalia after that um, part of history, but Eritrea held out. Now, this time, it is the Eritreans as well as the other groups in Ethiopia who did not accept the dominance of the Ethiopian government for more than 30 years by the Tigray uh, liberate or Tigray ident based identity uh, which ruled this, right. uh, this country. That this led to this kind of uh, up, uh, upsurge earlier, removal of Tigray government at one point, and then 
That was the response which the Tigray uh, Liberation Front had. They wanted them to take back power and therefore the military revolt that took place. So the complex picture over here is not very different from what's happening in other parts of Africa, where the ex-colonial powers and the United States wants to keep the African groups fighting each other. And through this, decide, deciding who is the winner, who is the loser, try still to maintain their neo-colonial exploitation of the resources of the region. Tigray was their favorite player. Now Tigray has clearly lost the military war. Therefore, they had to come to an agreement. But how much they will still retain their power, how much will they continue to be backed by the United States, these are the key, key questions. Right. The future of Ethiopia, as all of these colonial wars, is whether the countries which are under this kind of attack can rise above the imperial invasions that are taking place by siding one, going with one side or the other, whether they can really overcome that. And that is a much more difficult question because already the identities, ethnicities, etc., have been fanned up to the extent that the original nation states which existed, to put them back together is not going to be that easy. Right. And I think that is the much larger battle we are seeing in Africa, whether it's sub-Saharan Africa or now in Northern Africa. And already we have seen the destruction of Somalia. What's going to happen to Mali is not clear. Ethiopia has been under this kind of civil war for quite some time. So the gradual destruction of the states is doesn't bode well for Africa or for the world. Can we overcome, therefore, the colonial interventions in these in this places and see whether nationalist forces are able to build a unity among themselves and therefore reject the foreign interventions that are taking place, France, another colonial power in Francophone Africa, and of course the United States with its number of floating bases in Africa, which we have talked about earlier. Right. Thank you so much, Rabir. So there we have it, an election and a peace agreement to uh, two different regions, of course, but also two processes that could, be of, uh, that could have a huge impact on the configurations, the various geopolitical configurations around the world. We'll be discussing many similar issues in future episodes of Mapping Fault Lines. Until then, keep watching this click.